first part of the lecture, we'll be meeting Mormon missionaries, the do's and the don'ts. And then the second part, we'll deal with uh, the priesthood. Where do you get your authority? And we will be discussing this because these are very key areas in Mormonism. Perhaps we preface our remarks by saying that when we are dealing with the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints Mormon, which is the major body, we are dealing with a membership of approximately 3,300,000 people. With an income, according to Time magazine and Fortune magazine, in excess of $1 billion per year. The Mormon complex, from the perspective of economics and financial control, uh, has tentacles that reach clear around the world. U.S. Industries controls Jack LaLanne's health spas and a great many of the health spas that you see in the United States. The Mormon Church, through its investment, controls approximately 78% of the sugar beet industry of the United States. We also know that they have large blocks of stock in the Central Pacific Railroad and uh, in Zion Mercantile, which is a very big thing in Utah and in the uh, Southwest. We know that the Mormon Church has vast holdings and that they use these resources as a means of attracting people to their church. The Polynesian Cultural Center is a classic example of this on the island of Hawaii, which is Mormon-sponsored and financed. When you go there, if you get to Hawaii, you should go and see it, simply because of its cultural and anthropological value, but also as a lesson on how to spend money to attract people's attention. The Mormon Church is capable of doing this and does it quite frequently. They utilize all their contacts, and everybody who's ever been anybody politically in Mormonism utilizes whatever contact that they make to further the goals of the church because all of them have done their missionary tours and they are missionaries at heart. Right now the Mormon church is pushing almost 20,000 full-time missionaries around the world. Now you've got to keep in mind that the total world mission force, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, is less than 95,000 people. The Mormons are now pushing up to more than a fifth of that total force around the world. I think this is something that ought to arrest our thoughts and cause us to reflect upon the growth and development of the Mormon Church. In addition to these things about Mormonism, we have to go on record as saying that it is impossible to fault the Mormons for their zeal, for their dedication, for their willingness to sacrifice, for carving an empire out of the desert which they most assuredly did in the valley of the Great Salt Lake, for multiplying business acumen into great financial resources. They are only to be applauded, if not envied by some people, as they are today. They are the only denomination that willingly pays taxes on its income, which indicates that they have a sense of community need and identification with the needs of their fellow men. Mormon missionary force is well known throughout the world. The hot shops where a great many people eat are funded by Mormon money. The Marriott Motor Lodges, Mr. Marriott being a close friend of the former president, Mr. Nixon, uh, is a very powerful Mormon. And uh, Mormons uh, today are well known politically, economically, and religiously. I know many fine, upstanding, decent, ethical, moral Mormons, many of whom lead lives on the surface that would put a great many professing Christians to shame. But the question must automatically be asked, is this what saves the soul? Because if Christian ethics and Christian morality and the veneer of Christian terminology is sufficient to redeem one, then it's possible for Jehovah's Witnesses to be redeemed on the same basis. Possible for Christian science on the same basis. Possible for the Unity School of Christianity, the Mind Sciences. Possible for the Spiritist Church. Possible for the whole kingdom of the cults to make exactly the same appeal. And that appeal is, we're ethical, we're moral, we're following the teachings of Jesus, we are using Christian terms. We are trying to emulate the Christian gospel. We are following the great way shower, Christ Jesus. Therefore, we're Christians. So the Mormon claim to being Christian on that basis will not stand up. Another important point is that Mormonism began with an angelic revelation. 
It is the only cult to so begin. We are warned in Galatians chapter 1 by the Apostle Paul. If anybody, even an angel out of heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, anathema. He uses the strongest word in New Testament Greek. Cursed by God. And then just in case we miss the point, he says, as I said before, I say it again. If anybody preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, anathema, under the divine curse. So even if an angel materializes in your bedroom and says, go dig in the hill riverside, <laughs> and there you will find marvelous silver plates written in unreformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, and you translate this through the use of some miraculous type of thing, and you get something akin to the Book of Mormon, and then calling upon these special powers which you have derived, you call yourself a prophet of the new dispensation, the restoration of Christianity, and proceed in Jesus' name to heal the sick and cleanse the leper and work miracles, and then to teach doctrine, which is the antithesis of the Christian message. You will have a fulfillment of Mormonism in the 20th century. Because this is precisely what happened in the 19th century. That is how the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, began. Joseph Smith, Jr. maintained that he had a vision from God the Father. Later, the vision was changed to include the Lord Jesus Christ. Later, the vision was changed to include the angels. The vision apparently was amended from time to time in order to get all of the glory in it at once. However, I think if any of us had had an encounter with God the Father, to the exclusion of Jesus Christ, we would have noted it. If we'd had an encounter with God the Father and Jesus Christ, I think we would have noted it. To have had a vision including God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the myriads of holy angels, I think that would have been enough to make a lasting impression on anybody. And yet we find Joseph Smith, Jr., the Mormon prophet, saying a few years later in his meditations that he had reached the place where he wasn't sure there was a God anymore. Now, if God the Father spoke to you and Jesus Christ and the angels, I don't think you'd find yourself in the place of asking whether or not he was there, unless you wanted to admit to hallucination. Joseph denied this. Now, Mormonism is built, therefore, upon one big word. I want to give it to you. Existential revelation. Existential revelation. Just take the word exist for kicks. E-N-T-I-A-L. Existential. Which means an actual encounter revelation in which you meet heavenly beings or supernatural beings. I am not talking out of flying saucers, such as our occultic friends are writing about and speaking about today. I'm talking about in the context of biblical revelation. But that's what Joseph Smith claimed. He claimed for his authority, not the Bible, but first and foremost, Existential encounter, existential revelation, personal experience. All Mormonism rests upon personal experience. Joseph's personal experience. If Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, was not telling the truth, the whole superstructure of Mormon theology collapses. You don't have to argue about anything else. If Joseph wasn't telling the truth, there isn't anything else. A great many Christians spend their time attacking the Mormons on polygamy. So when meeting Mormon missionaries, the first don't is don't get involved in arguing peripheral doctrines. For heaven's sakes, and I mean that literally, <laughs> don't start arguing with them about polygamy. And about how many wives Joseph had and Brigham had. And the early Mormons had. 
Because the Mormons today have only one wife. One wife per Mormon. They get sealed in the temple to many women. And in the resurrection, those women are resurrected from the dead to be their wives. And with those women, they sexually will procreate children as resurrected and immortal gods for all eternity. That's Mormon theology. Polygamy was ruled out by the government of the United States, but the Mormons got a revelation which ruled it in after the resurrection. Now, Christians generally get involved in peripheral argumentation on polygamy almost immediately when a Mormon missionary comes. Stay off it. You'll get no place. And the Mormons have stock answers for you. Some of them are rather good. How can you indict us for the sins of our parents? Would you like to be indicted for the shortcomings of your relatives? Personally speaking, God forbid. <laughs> and immediately, you see, you're on the defensive. Now, the Mormons practice polygamy for a reason. The reason they practice it is because they got a revelation from Joseph Smith, allegedly from God, which told them that the soul of man pre-exists before it enters the world. That's a primary Mormon doctrine, the pre-existence of the soul. You existed before you got here. And in order to create bodies for these souls to live in, and that the bodies would be Mormon bodies, so that they would be redeemed. The Mormons were urged to practice polygamy to procreate more bodies. That's the argument. And that's what Joseph said. They did. But it didn't work out. The government of the United States, always averse to too many deductions from income tax, felt that this could inevitably become the great ripoff of all time. And so, for political reasons purely, I assure you, they told the Mormons to cease and desist the practice of polygamy. Or they would confiscate all Mormon property and exile the Mormons to Mexico. That's on the record. Immediately, the Mormons received another existential revelation. Another encounter. This time, Joseph Smith was dead. So was Brigham Young. But the succeeding presidency of the church embodies the authority of the church in Revelation. And President Wilford Woodruff informed them in 1891 that polygamy was to cease. He himself didn't take it too seriously because he was arrested three or four years later for having five or six wives too many. But gradually, polygamy was pushed out of the Mormon church, except for some fundamental effects who took off across the border into Arizona, and some of them are still around. But the official position of the Church of Jesus Christ out of day saints on polygamy is we're against it. But they are not against eternal polygamy. One God with multiple women. Because in Mormonism, the goal of every Mormon male of the priesthood is to progress to deity so that he may be the ruler of a world with his own private harem. Now, some people, when I say this publicly, say, oh, they really don't believe that, do they? Yes, they really do. <laughs> I am amazed at the naivete of Christians who... When evil is in front of them in block letters four feet high, we'll look right at it and say, Oh, you, it couldn't be that. Well, it is. And we just might as well face it. I am for believing the cults when they tell me something is their doctrine. I am not for saying, well, I, I just can't believe that. If I do, I'll never understand them. I've got to take them for what they say they believe. If I can't take them for what they say they believe, we have lost all possibility of communication. On the subject of polygamy, don't get yourself in it. You get no place. 
if it comes up and you have to say something in meeting the Mormon missionary, then approach it a way that he's not really prepared for. Say, I know that you people practice polygamy in times past. And he's all ready with his Mormon missionary manual, copy of which I have here, <laughs> to give you answers. But instead of you attacking you say magnanimously and kindly in a loving Christian spirit that I understand what the problem was and we don't want to indict your relatives and you and everybody else. What we want to do is just deal with the facts as they are now. We don't want to hold you accountable for their mistakes. You have just pulled the fangs of one of the foremost Mormon arguments how they're persecuted by the Christian church. Now you are not a persecutor, you are a loving, understanding reconciler. And you have swept polygamy aside. It is peripheral, since it is no longer practiced. The main thing is, get down to the grassroots, to the nitty-gritty of Mormon theology. Now, a second don't when dealing with Mormon missionaries. Don't, if it is humanly possible, chew up Joseph Smith and Brigham Young as people. I realize that's a great temptation. Because they said many things and did many things subject to such vigorous criticism. However, structure any criticism of Mormon prophets this way. I have nothing against Joseph Smith and Brigham Young as people. My criticism is against the system of theology that they said God gave them. We don't want to argue with people. We want to discuss the system. After all, it's a pretty sorry state when a group of intelligent people can't sit down and objectively discuss religion without getting personal and nasty. You have now disarmed the average Mormon who has been programmed to believe that you are basically hostile to him. That's imperative. Because the Christian has no right to be hostile to the Mormon. The scripture says our warfare is not against flesh and blood. And that should be memorized by every Christian. I don't mean parroted it. I mean committed to memory as part of one's life. We learn Bible verses many times in the Christian church. Cases of their nice things to have tucked around when you want to whip them out and thump somebody on the head with them. That is not the purpose of memorization of Scripture. The purpose of Scripture memorization is not proof texting your pet theology or doctrine. Scripture memorization is for the feeding of your spiritual nature and the means whereby to communicate with somebody else's spiritual nature. The Mormon has been told you're hostile. We are classified as Gentiles. Now, there are three classes of people in Mormon theology. Jews, Gentiles, and saints. The Jews, we know all about. That's classical history. The Gentiles is every non-Mormon. And the saints are, guess who? The Mormon church. Joseph Smith, describing the Christian church, made no bones about his position. In the first vision that he got in 1820, he said God personally told him, personally, that all the religions were wrong. That took care of the religions. And that all of the people who professed the religions were corrupt. And the creeds were abominable. So that took care of the people, 
That took care of the religions, and that took care of the theology. In four lines, Joseph wiped out all Christendom. And all that was left was the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Now for a couple of positives. Do remember what I just said. And point out to the Mormons that we are not hostile to them. They began with hostility toward the church. But despite that hostility, we want them to know we love them. And you want to add to that. If Joseph Smith's vision is right, there was no Christianity on the earth. It was gone until the Restoration. When did it disappear? First century. When was it restored? Nineteen. Well, let's see. That's a considerable gap for the absence of the gospel. The gospel of the tears wasn't preached by Origen, Tertullian, Polycarp, Irenaeus, certainly not by Gregory the First, never by Augustine, could have been preached by Jerome, and then of course, Eusebius couldn't have done it. None of the church fathers qualify. And then Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, Wesley, all couldn't have been preaching the gospel because they were preaching the same things that we are preaching. And it's completely different from what the Mormon church is preaching. So the gospel disappeared from the face of the earth until Joseph restored it. Now that point must be pressed. Lovingly, but pressed. Have you ever seen a trash compactor? A trash compactor operates on the principle that you begin with gradual pressure, increasing it until you reach generally about 3,000 to 3,200 pounds of pressure. At which point there is an enormous crunch in your kitchen, and what you thought was indestructible has now been waferized. <laughs> I suggest using this analogy that you remember that this is precisely what the gospel does to false doctrine. But don't slam the gears in full blast the moment you start talking. Because you're liable to waferize the missionaries and never have any opportunity to use them for anything else but a frisbee from that time on. <laughs> Mormon frisbees just will not make good Christians. <laughs> now, of course, we're being humorous about the point, but you know, there's a serious note to this. There's an awful lot of Christians who have the trash compactor approach. They're good for about five minutes, and then their blood pressure soars into the stratosphere. They forget all about the fruit of the Spirit, and they can't even spell the gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> and what happens immediately after that is knock-down, drag-out argumentation. Enormous heat is generated, and very little light. Do point out to the Mormon that war was declared against the church, theological war, but not by the church. Joseph's first vision gives your authorization. I've reproduced this in the Kingdom of the Cults and also in my pamphlet on Mormonism, giving the reference to it, which the official version of it, so to speak. There are three official versions, but the one that they've circulated the most. And you can point to this. Very important to get that point across. We're not hostile. They're hostile. How come they don't love us? We love them for Christ's sake. A second do with Mormon missionaries. 
do emphasize with them the fact that their church recognizes four revelations equal in validity and authority. One, the Book of Mormon. Two, Doctrine and Covenants. Three, the Pearl of Great Price. And four, the Bible, insofar as it is correctly translated. What does that phrase mean? That phrase is an escape clause inserted by Mormon theologians with the idea that if ever they have a conflict with the Scriptures, at that juncture they can say it's not correctly translated there. Now be careful. If you ever have that thrown at you, here's the answer to it. Oh, uh, you read Greek and Hebrew? And the Mormon will say, well, no, actually I don't. Well, how do you know it's incorrectly translated? And the Mormon will say, well, because it disagrees with the other three. And then you can say, oh, but tell me, did the same God inspire all those four books? Yes, says the Mormon missionary. Are they all of equal validity? Yes, says the Mormon missionary. Does God ever lie? No, says the Mormon missionary. Can God be relied upon at all times? Yes, says the Mormon missionary. Which is the oldest of these four revelations? Why, the Bible, which spans a period of 5,000 odd years. Much, much older than the others. Right? Right. Well then, don't you think it's altogether proper that we judge the younger revelations by the oldest revelation because God, who cannot lie, is going to tell us the straight story from the very beginning. And if the other books don't agree with the oldest book, why then, obviously, something must be wrong with the younger books. Right? Uh, that will about terminate any discourse on the subject of insofar as it's correctly translated. I cannot emphasize how important this is. When I lectured to a class as I do here, I like to use humor. I am not above using sarcasm because Elijah gave me my authority for so doing with the prophets of Baal. And when it is necessary, it can be an awesome weapon. But I am firmly convinced that what we are talking about among ourselves, in terms of how we view these things, must never ever be communicated to the person we are talking to, lest the person interpret our unbelief as somehow or other casting aspersion upon their sincere belief. Let me illustrate it. I was preaching in Oregon about two years ago, and a Mormon doctor, well-educated, in medicine, but poorly educated in theology, stood up and challenged me to a debate publicly on the steps of the church outside. I was a liar, a deceiver, and he went on at some length. I recognized immediately that he was reacting psychologically and violently to the fact that what he thought was divine revelation suddenly to an empirical mind, and he was a scientist, was questionable. And his reaction was instantaneous defense. Once you implant the seeds of doubt in the mind of a well-organized thinker, you are quite likely to get a violent outburst. You must be prepared for it. You must understand that the violent outburst and the antagonism and the anger and sometimes the language 
has nothing whatsoever to do with you. You are only the Western Union messenger boy who delivered God's message. They are really, the scripture says, at war with who? God. And because the carnal mind is at enmity with God, cannot be controlled by Him, will not be at peace with Him, it will lash out in defense. You are the only visible object, therefore you are for it. And you'll get your share. Well, some of the Christians there took umbrage, became very defensive. And we had over a thousand people in the auditorium, and some of them started to jump up and down and rebuke this doctor. And I said, now just a moment. Everybody just sit down. Everybody sat down. I said, doctor, I sympathize with your feeling. I understand your emotional conflict at this moment. I know that you are antagonistic to me personally. I'm sorry for that. But you'll notice the entire evening I've spent my time doing nothing but discussing your theology. I never made a reference to anybody in the line of a personal attack. I said, your response, however, to me has not been to question or disprove one single thing which I have said this evening, all of which came from your own files and archives. Instead, you had to attack me personally. I said, you are at liberty to do so. I will debate you. And I'm going back there to debate him. We plan to have about two or 3,000 people present with about 20 churches cooperating. I don't think the Mormon church is ever going to let him hear that auditorium. But I am responding to his challenge. For that purpose, it has to be done. Lest my silence be construed as admission of guilt. But an incident happened right at that moment that was very significant. I said, Doctor, do you have a copy of Book of Mormon? I would like you to check some of these references and read them out and find out whether I've said the truth. Well, you have to remember the context of this. Heated, electric, a lot of Mormons in the audience, and a balcony above in this church. And a Christian up there said, I got a copy of the Book of Mormon. And he just tossed it over the balcony like that, and it went sailing down the aisle. Boom! On the floor. You know, it was as if somebody had just slapped that man right across the face. And it, you have to see this. It was not a, an occasion of humor. You have to see. These people are committed to this as an infallible oracle. It's holy. And it was just, you know, <laughs> boom, down. See? Well, I saw this immediately, and I said, please, everybody stop. And someone reached over in the aisle and picked it up, dusted it off, and handed it to the doctor. I said, doctor, please accept my heartfelt apology for what you most certainly must feel is a desecration. I do not share your conviction. But I do empathize and sympathize with your conviction and your right to hold it. I'm sure the gentleman that dropped it from the balcony had no intention of insulting you. Is that correct, brother? He said, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I said, fine. I said, now, with that apology, I said, can we go to the references? Well, he can't like that. And we went through some references, and it was obvious he just didn't know. And I'm going back to the debate. And I assure you it will be, uh, I trust, a memorable occasion in the vindication of the gospel because it has to be done. But I want you to see the psychological climate involved here. To them, these books are holy. Therefore, the force of the argument I am bringing to bear on it, namely, the Bible is the oldest revelation, testing the other revelations by it, all of them being inspired by the same God for the sake of argument. Utterly nonpluses the Mormon mind. They're not ready for this. And indeed, there was no answer. 
you must understand the importance of that point. Another important do when dealing with Mormons. Do be willing to acknowledge the perpetuity of divine revelation. What do I mean by that? <laughs> Fool to that time, huh? Thought I was going to come up with a sneaky one. No, it's very simple. Many times when you're talking with a Mormon missionary, or a Mormon, a well-informed Mormon now, the person will say, Don't you believe that God could have spoken through Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and all the members of the Mormon church if he wanted to? Don't you believe in prophecy? Don't you believe in the gift of prophecy? Don't you believe that if God wants to reveal himself today, just as he did in apostolic times, he can do so? Don't you believe that God could have done this? Now, the biggest mistake you will ever make is to stick your neck on that little theological chopping block which your first year seminary student will tell you is a design disaster area. It's an old chestnut. Look out for it. If you say no, you are committing the fallacy of limiting omnipotence. And if you say yes, you have pulled the fangs of the whole argument, providing you conclude it the right way. Now I'll run it over again. If you say no, a Mormon will say to you, if he's sharp, and they're sharp ones, some with PhDs from Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Princeton, they have more people listed in who's who in America than any other denomination. Did you know that? Don't sell the Mormon intellect short. Theological spiritual blindness is one thing. Intellectual perceptivity is quite another. Don't be a fool. Never underestimate the nature of the adversary. It's better to overestimate than underestimate. A lesson most military logicians learn at their unfortunate peril in history. You've got to say, I cannot limit an all-powerful God. If God wants to reveal himself today, who can prevent him from doing so? Omnipotence is limited only by his word and his nature. If he says in his word he will not reveal any more, he imposes the limitation. He has not, I repeat, not said that anywhere to his nature. His nature is infinite purity, holiness, righteous justice and goodness. He cannot violate that nature. Therefore, his decisions must be perfectly congruent with that nature. In eternity, as well as in time and space, God can say nothing in eternity that he contradicts in time and space or vice versa. Because he is thoroughly consistent in his nature. Unless his nature rules something out, which in this instance, Revelation, it does not. Perfectly admissible. Now you conclude. Of course God could have spoken through Joseph Smith. Of course he could have spoken through Brigham Young and all the members of the Mormon church. Of course it's possible that your church is the restored church of Jesus Christ. Of course it's possible that Jesus Christ appeared on this continent. Of course it's possible. The important question to be asked is, what is the evidence for it? Not, is it possible, but did it really happen? And the only way we can ascertain that 
is by checking what you say happened in your revelation by what God has to say in his. We know God has spoken here. Here we're safe. Holy Scripture. The Bible. I mean you. So we take Scripture and we say to the Mormon missionary, we must test your revelation by the oldest revelation. And we find out that the Bible says there is only one God. And Joseph Smith says there are many. The Bible says Jesus Christ is unique and Joseph Smith says he's one God among many gods. The Bible says salvation is by grace alone through faith in the blood of Calvary. Mormonism says salvation is by repentance, baptism, faith, and good works and obedience to the laws and the ordinance of the gospel as taught by the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Right down the line, we start making comparisons to find out. And we test what Joseph Smith and Brigham Young said because they are the two founding prophets of the church. And then we apply the biblical text, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Please turn to it in your Bibles as evidence of some good biblical testing. Deuteronomy chapter 18. I will raise them up a prophet, verse 18, from among their brethren like unto thee, and he will, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them, and I shall command him. We know that this was applicable to Joshua, who succeeded Moses, and we know that it was a messianic prophecy from the New Testament revelation concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the prophecy in the New Testament. Verse 20, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall be executed. In the name of what? Other gods. Oh. In other words, if you are a polytheistic prophet, please note that, if you are a polytheistic prophet, you are not a prophet of God. The only prophets of God are what? Monotheistic. Because there is only one God. Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. I am God. There is no one else. That's about as clear as the Lord could get. If thou shalt say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. You shall not pay any attention to him. King James says, you shall not be afraid of him. The Hebrew is beautiful. The Hebrew says, you shall not bother having any respect for him. Simple as that. Now, I want you to lock together Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy chapter 13. The two go together. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, that is a seer, and gives you a sign or a miracle, and the sign of the miracle comes to pass. And he says, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. So it's possible for a false prophet to arise. Now, please notice this. Show it to a Mormon missionary. It is possible for a false prophet to arise to show signs and wonders and for Satan to cause things to happen. Because God's not doing it. In order to confirm the words of the prophet. Oh, says the interested person, Mormon or Christian, then how are you going to know who is of God and who is of the devil? Answer? If he says to you, verse 2, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, you should not listen to him. That's the acid test. The true prophet of God urges you to the service, the worship, the adoration of the only true and living God. Israel was 
from its conception. Monotheistic. The ultimate sin to the Jewish mind is to say that there are other gods. The worship of the golden calf brought the wrath of Jehovah upon the Jews who were delivered from Egypt. When God spoke to Moses, Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, from the burning bush, and Moses said to him, Whom shall I say has sent me? The word thunders back out of the bush. I am that I am. Thus says the Eternal One. You shall say to the children of Israel, Asha hath sent me. The Eternal. That's good enough. Moses said, Right on, Lord. No problem after that at all. Go. My presence will go with thee. And from that poor old man of 80 years of age, wandering around chasing sheep, sheep and goats in Midian, who figured he'd had it, the eternal breathed from a bush. Not from a magnificent city. Not from a golden palace. Not to a man decked in the raiment of the world, whose wall was plastered with the degrees of human accomplishment. But a tired old man of 80. And said, go, I will go with you. Who was going with him? Aisha. That's as close as you could get to it. The Eternal One. I was. I am. I will be into the endless eons of eternity. That's the identity of the eternal God. Judaism enshrined this. Adored this. Because they had been gifted with what no other nation in the world had ever seen. They had been selected for reasons known only to God. He said, not because of your goodness, not because you were better than other nations, not because you were special, but according to the counsel of his own will, he chose sovereign. And he embedded in the consciousness of every Jew, who whether he dies a Christian or a Jew, dies remembering Hear, O oh, hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That was drilled into the mind of the Jew. That chud, one God. For that he died, because there was only one. The horror of Mormonism in dealing with the Mormon missionary is that you are dealing with people who are polytheistic and have no concept of the God of the Bible. In order to introduce the concept of the God of the Bible to them, it has to be patient, it has to be systematic, it has to be loving, but it must be forceful. And it must penetrate. And it will get through. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, where the joints meet the marrow and judges the thoughts and the intents of the soul. That is a most uncomfortable thought. But that is the Word of God, living and written, that we encounter. When we see this in talking with Mormons, you've got to get them, step by step, to the authority of the oldest revelation and to the character of the God that inspired it. Not by might, nor by power, by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. And then, I would make, of course there are many suggestions we could make, but I would make one other important suggestion in concluding this section. I would suggest when you are talking with Mormon missionaries, 
that you do not take the usage of their terminology to be on an equal par with our own. If a Mormon says God, Jesus Christ, atonement, salvation, don't buy it as in the context of historic Christianity because you'll be sadly mistaken. In Christianity, when the Christian says God, we are talking about God triune, Father, Son, and Holy, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one nature, co-eternal. When we are talking about Jesus Christ, we are talking about God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity. God from God, light from light, very God from very God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. We are talking about the imprint of the Father's nature, the representation stamped in flesh of the Father's character. We are talking about no less than God incarnate. Not a God incarnate, not one of many gods, but the eternal God Himself, all that He can ever mean to man here and now in flesh. Colossians 2.9 In Him dwells all the fullness, pladomates theotetos, somaticos, the fullness of God Himself in flesh. That's Christ. Dr. Machen once rendered Romans 9.5 this way, Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. I concur. That's the whole theme of the New Testament. That must be brought across in dealing with Mormons. Must never be forgotten. We're dealing with the person of the Savior. And we must identify the Savior. Who he is. The Mormon Savior is a polygamist. The Mormon Savior was married to the Marys and Martha. The Mormon Savior begat children. The Mormon Savior was the spirit brother of Lucifer. The Mormon Savior is the direct product of sexual intercourse between Adam God, a resurrected God, and the Virgin Mary. We are not talking about God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity. We are talking about the romance of the gods, Mormon mythology, which we'll get into later. You must never take the terminology for granted. Now I'm sure you're sitting here and you're saying, in this audience of a couple of hundred young people, who want to go out and evangelize the cults and the occult? You're saying, this sounds very serious. You are very serious. Yes, I am very serious. Because I've watched cultists die without Christ. I've watched people go into the darkness from which there is no return without Him. I've seen the watchtower seers and the Mormon prophets weave their webs. And I've seen the families disjointed and fragmented and husbands split from wives and daughter-in-law from mother-in-law. I've seen the disruption, the confusion, and the disintegration at the heart of the being of humans. If that doesn't touch the soul and make this thing deadly serious, so that we are concerned that people know the real Jesus, the real Holy Spirit, and the real gospel. Nothing in this world is ever going to move us. It must become something to us that people are dying in their sins. And I'm going to tell you something that maybe you've only guessed that, but you don't know. I do know, I'll tell you. And a lot of pastors get angry at me when I say it. But I'll say it anyhow because it's true. Somebody's got to say it. We have been lulling the Christian church to sleep for a hundred years. And we have been telling people only half the story. One half of the story is Jesus loves you and died for you on the cross. The other half of the story is you are going to go to hell unless you buy that gospel. That's the other side of the story. And if that side of the story isn't told... God's going to hold us personally accountable. And I'll tell you the reason why we haven't got ten times as many people here right now. This is the reason. 
the great majority of Christians in evangelical churches do not believe that the people in the cults are really lost. Now, you just get a hold of some Methodists, Episcopalians, Baptists, get them, I don't care who they are, dig them out, and you start pressing them. What do you think is going to happen to the Jehovah's Witnesses? Oh, well, that's, that's, that's bad doctrine. Yeah, that, that certainly is wrong. What about the Mormons? Oh, that, that's bad stuff. Yeah, I can't, can't go along with that. Well, do you think that if a Mormon believes that in good conscience, that they're going to go to hell? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not the judge of those sort of things. I mean, I, mean, I don't have to, to handle things like that. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I sure do pray for those people, and I have concern for them. To scrape off the veneer. Underneath the veneer are people who in their souls do not really believe in an eternal hell for the lost. Just try it sometime. Maybe for Hitler, Stalin, Eichmann, maybe for some murderers and all kinds of other people, but for an ethical, moral, upright, hard-working imitation Christian? Eternal hell? Oh, unthinkable. And that's why they don't do anything. And unless we can see that the destiny of men without Christ is judgment, we can never be moved to reach them. It's only when we see the horror of hell that we can appreciate the eternal bliss of heaven. And you know something? Only the Christian knows the horror of hell. You say, that's a strange statement. How can a redeemed person, a redeemed person, how is it possible to know the horror of hell? Why, the unregenerate have got to know it. The ones that are there, yes, but we're talking about the ones that are still walking around and breathing. No unregenerate man right this moment has any concept of hell. If he did, he would be fleeing to the church of Jesus Christ. Who has the real concept of hell? The Christian. Because the Christian has been saved from it. By grace. And so the Christian can say... Man, I know what it's all about. I know where it's at. And when we split this life, it's either with Jesus or... And the person says, you don't really... I mean, fire, you know, and, and, and it, it, you don't think that. One fellow got so upset when I preached a sermon one time on the subject of eternal judgment. He said... You don't think God's going to roast people over a cosmic spit for all eternity, do you? And I said, where'd you ever find that in the Scriptures? He said, well, that's what it sounds like to me. I said, because you've got problems. That upset him terribly. And I close with this. Reuben A. Torrey, perhaps one of the greatest Bible teachers we ever had, and the teacher of Donald Barnhouse, my teacher, once was walking down the street in Chicago, and saw a classmate of his from seminary. Tory was a very forthright man. He didn't waste words. Hadn't seen the man in 30 years. The man said, How are you, Rube? Good to see you. Tory said, Fine. How are you? And they shook hands. They chatted about their families and what they were doing and so forth. This man was a minister. And Tory said to him, Well, he said, How's your theology? He said, Same as it was when we were in school together. And the fellow said, Well, he said, There's a few changes, Rube. He said, I don't believe in hell anymore. And Tory just stopped short, right in the middle of the conversation. Looked into this man's eyes. Pushed his finger into his vest. And said to him, There's indescribable sin in your life, George. And the man just disintegrated right on the spot. Huh? What, what, do you, what do you mean? Well, I haven't seen you in 30 years. And Tory said, Who can turn? Who can turn 
from preaching the doctrine of God's justice is himself frightened of it. And you wouldn't be frightened if there wasn't sin in your life, George. And it's sin in your life, and you are frightened. And so you're saying, I won't believe it anymore. But it's true. I know it's true. And you know it's true, George. Because Jesus said so. The man was shaking on the street corner in a matter of minutes. Weeping. Called back to that great truth. What was Calvary? The terrible price that God paid to save men from what? Hell. And that's the real horror of Mormonism. Ethical, moral, upright people. Building a kingdom of works apart from the grace of God. Followers of false prophets desperately in need of the real Jesus.